consulting company, Perot Systems, had a role in raising energy prices in California. Witnesses included Terry Winter, president of the organization that regulates much of California's power grid, and former employees of Enron and Perot Systems. Mr. Perot was scheduled to testify, but did not attend the hearing. Representative Doug Osi chairs the subcommittee. This is two hours and 15 minutes. With the two o'clock hearing. The last few months, the news media has been filled with examples of companies attempting to game the California electricity market. Many elected officials in my home state of California have pointed to these examples as proof that Californians were taken advantage of by corporate greed. Today, this subcommittee will investigate these matters to get a better understanding of their true role in the California energy crisis. I do look forward to the tes testimony of the witnesses today. I am eager to hear firsthand about the activities of Perot Systems in particular. Did it, in fact, share confidential information with other market participants? Was it running what some have called a crime school in this regard? Did it notify the California Independent System Operator or the California Power Exchange of the flaws in the market design that it found? More importantly than the actions of any market participant, I am interested in how the Cal ISO responded to the various challenges that it faced. When it learned of outside marketing activities, how did it respond? Did it deem such activities a threat to the market? Was the Cal ISO aware of and did it understand these games at the time? If so, did it attempt to fix the holes in the market structure? Finally, will the Cal ISO's Market Design 2002 proposal, which FERC approved last week, prevent the kind of activities that occurred in California from reoccurring? As I continue to state, on every occasion I can, getting the electricity market design right should be our foremost priority. As we continue to review this issue, I will be particularly focused on how market design contributed to or prevented the types of games that, we were play that were played in California. Now, as an aside, I will tell you I am not happy today. We have asked a couple people to join us, and they have declined the opportunity. I happen to think that particularly in light of the activities going on in the financial markets, having folks who were actively participating in, this, in these efforts are critical to assuring the American people that this type of thing will be brought to a halt and that they can be confident in corporate America and their personal portfolios, if nothing else. I am profoundly disappointed at the absence of Mr. Perot and Mr. Belden, and I'm not happy about it. And it's probably not the last time we're going to hear about this matter. I'd like to yield to my friend from California, Mr. Waxman, for the purposes of an opening statement. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I, too, share your unhappiness with those witnesses that are not here today. I, I, before I give my opening statement, I want to point out that you and I have had discussions about other witnesses, uh, particularly State Senator Dunn from California. And in our conversation, you agreed that we would have another opportunity uh, to have a meeting of this uh, committee to hear from him and other witnesses recommended by the Democrats. And if the gentleman would yield, certainly. I guarantee you we will visit this issue and I will work with you to make that happen. And then we will have some. And we will have a hearing. And, and we'll, there and will be the minority witnesses. Okay. I thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, it is, it is important that we investigate what happened in the Western energy markets in 2000 and 2001. However, the way this hearing has been set up is very odd. It is more notable for who is not here today instead of who is. This hearing is entitled California Energy Market, the case of Enron and Perot Systems. Yet today, not only don't we have any witness from Enron testifying, but Ross Perot, who was supposed to be this afternoon's key witness, isn't here either. As of Friday, we had been told that former Enron employee Mr. Tim Belden would be testifying today. Mr. Belden would have been a very useful witness to hear from since he headed the Enron office, which apparently cooked up the trading schemes that manipulated Western markets. The odd thing is, Mr. Chairman, that we learned over the weekend from Mr. Belden's lawyer that Mr. Belden never had any intention of testifying today. I do not think it is inappropriate to expect that we should have Enron witnesses at a hearing that focuses on Enron. 
We should also benefit from other ongoing investigations when it's possible to do so. The one person who has uncovered the most information on Perot systems is California's State Senator Joe Dunn, and I hoped he would be here today, but I appreciate that you've offered to have him testify at an additional day of hearings. It's worth taking a moment to recall how we got here and why this is such an important issue. In 2000 and 2001, Western families were ruthlessly price gouged by energy companies. The future of families in California and other Western states was in effect mortgaged in the short term, uh, for the short term benefit of energy executives like Ken Lay and Jeffrey Skilling. The economic welfare of the entire West was jeopardized as energy prices skyrocketed out of control. The wholesale cost of electricity for California in 1999 was $7 billion. In 2000, it was $27 billion. And if not for timely actions taken by the state government, it would easily have surpassed that number in 2001. At the time, evidence from government, academia, and the private sector showed that energy companies were manipulating markets to increase profits. For example, over 18 months ago, Enron Chairman Ken Lay publicly discussed his view that, quote, the system invites gaming, end quote. Yet the administration refused to acknowledge the price gouging. Energy Secretary Spencer Abraham dismissed claims that energy companies were conspiring to drive up prices as a myth. What a difference a year makes. Enron has stunningly collapsed and industry documents and admissions confirmed that market manipulation was an important cause of the energy crisis. This market manipulation cost California consumers billions of dollars. The most serious manipulation involved energy generators exercising market power by selling electricity at exorbitant prices or by holding supply off the market in order to drive up those prices. Power marketers also engaged in various trading strategies that increased costs and the possibility of rolling blackouts. These strategies are discussed in internal Enron memos, which became public this spring. They include submitting phony power schedules, deliberately overstating load to create the appearance of congestion on transmission lines, which would result in the state paying Enron to cut back on its load, and megawatt laundering or exporting power out of state and then immediately importing it back in order to uh, evade price caps. The Enron memos gave these ploys names like Fat Boy, Death Star, and Get Shorty. Perhaps the most cynical ploy was the simplest, buying price capped power in California and exporting it to other regions without a price cap. According to one memo written in December 2000, Enron believed that this strategy, quote, appears not to present any problems other than a public relations risk arising from the fact that such exports may have contributed to California's declaration of a stage two emergency yesterday. And I'm quoting, in their own memos, they said that's what they thought would make sense from their perspective, although they worried about the public relations problem. Recent admissions by at least seven major energy traders that they participated in fake round trip trades have further underscored the extent to which energy markets are subject to manipulation. Those companies, several of which conducted business in California, all conducted trades in which they exchanged the same amount of power at the same price with another company. The trades were apparently intended to exaggerate the company's revenues and make it appear that markets were more active than they really were. They may also have contributed to higher energy prices. One energy analyst described the trades as having enormous potential significance. And we've also recently learned that Ross Perot's company, Perot Systems, may have had a hand in California's energy crisis. In 1997, Perot Systems gained significant expertise 
with California's newly deregulated energy market by contracting with the California Independent System Operator. Apparently, Perot Systems then turned around and tried to market this expertise to energy companies seeking to increase their profits in the West. For months, many members of Congress have been calling on the Energy and Commerce Committee to hold hearings about the outrages that occurred in Western energy markets. Unfortunately, the Republican leadership has refused to allow hearings in that committee. So I am pleased that we are finally holding a hearing on the schemes that traders used to manipulate the markets in 2000 and 2001. Unfortunately, I'm concerned that this hearing will simply provide Perot Systems the opportunity to provide its unrebutted side of the story. I understand that why that's good for Ross Perot, but I don't understand how that will help us understand what happened in California and it prevent it from ever happening again. I want to thank uh, the chairman for agreeing to a minority day of hearings on this issue. At that hearing, we will finally be able to hear from Enron and Senator Dunn. I would like uh, to reach an agreement on a date for that hearing before the end of this afternoon's hearing, Mr. Chairman, if that's possible. I'd also like to ask unanimous consent to introduce into the record a prepared statement from Senator Dunn, along with a letter he has written to the chairman. And I'd also like to request that the hearing record be left open so that members can submit relevant materials and written questions to today's witnesses and those witnesses which declined to appear today so that we can get responses to put into the record. As it relates, Mr. Waxman, as it relates to the record, the record will be left open for 10 days for members to submit questions. I have sent the clerk to get the schedule of the committee and the availability of the room. And hopefully during the course of this hearing, we can work that out. And let me think about the other things you, what were the other items you mentioned? Whatever else it was to put in the record. Whatever uh, it was, else other was. Other documents that we have available. We will work to together. Sure. We'll make sure that the documents you referenced get in the record. And the other issues that you rose, we'll work those out too. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for your uh, spirit of cooperation and willingness to uh, try to get all these facts on the record. It's important we do so for our state. And it, it's not a partisan matter. It's a matter of simply trying to understand what happened in California and the other states in the West and make sure we don't have this sort of thing happen again. I know that's your intent as well. Thank you, Mr. Waxman. Uh, I know we've delivered, we delivered a copy of the letter from Perot to the minority. We're going to enter this into the record also at this time. Now, gentlemen, and this, this committee is an investigative committee. This is not judgmental in the sense that about what we're going to do. We swear everybody in. So we're going to ask you all to rise, raise your right hands. Those who would otherwise advise you in the background who we may need to have their names on the record, if you think they're going to provide input here, we're going to need to have them rise, be identified, and raise their right hand and be sworn in also. So, gentlemen, do you solemnly swear that the testimony we'll give today is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Let the record show that the witnesses all answered in the affirmative. Now, the way we proceed here is that each of the witnesses is given five minutes for the purpose of an opening statement. We have received your written statements, and we have reviewed them. Uh, I know that Mr. Waxman and I are very interested in getting to questions. I am going to be uh, punctual on the five-minute rule this afternoon. So to the extent that you can, you need to make sure you constrain yourselves to five minutes. Now, we have four witnesses with us today. We have Terry Winter, who's the president of the California Independent System Operator. We have Dr. Charles Sicchetti, who's the occupant of the Jeffrey Miller Chair in Government, Business, and the Economy from the University of Southern, Southern California. Why couldn't we get somebody from Cal Berkeley? We have George Backus, who's the president of the Policy Assessment Corporation, Corporation and we have Paul Gribbick, who's a former Perot Systems Corporation employee. As Mr. Waxman indicated, we also had invited Mr. Perot and Mr. Belden. Those invitations have been declined, and we have no written statement from them. Mr. Winter, you're, you're our first witness. You're recognized for five minutes. You need to turn the mic on by pushing the button. Mr. Chairman, member of the committee, thank you for inviting me here to discuss the uh, importance of electric consumers in California and throughout the western United States. I would like to emphasize four points today. First, 
you have invited me to discuss, among other things, the trading schemes described in the materials produced by Enro and Perot Systems in the past few months, and I will do so in a moment. I must stress, though, that as disturbing as some of the strategies described in the Enron and the Pro system materials are, the greatest potential harm to electric consumers in California and elsewhere comes not from the games that some clever traders may play, but from the persistent exercise of market power by suppliers and traders. By market power, I mean the ability of a single seller or group of sellers to command excessive prices on a sustained basis. It is this exercise of market power that cost California literally billions of dollars in the last two years. From startup four years ago, the ISO has placed particular emphasis on documenting and mitigating both suppliers' exercise of market power and their use of gaming strategies such as those described by the Enron Pro system materials. I am providing the committee with a chronology of activities the ISO has pursued in the past four years to direct to market power, gaming, and providing relief to consumers that have been victimized by the market. You will see there a strong and consistent emphasis on detecting, constraining, and combating market power. Through the turmoil of late 2000 and early 2001, our market analysis department and the independent market uh, Surveillance Committee repeated do repeatedly documented both the presence of market power in the California markets and its impact on the consumers. And we have proposed measures to control that market power. There have been times, indeed, when people have thought we have acted too aggressively. For instance, in, in June of 1998, we imposed a $250 price cap when prices suddenly rose to $9,000 plus. How have we responded to market manipulation? First, the ISO detected and issued directives specifically prohibiting some of the gaming strategies identified in the Enron memo. Second, the ISO modified its market designs to withhold payments to suppliers who were engaged in gaming strategy. Three, the ISO persuaded FERC to impose regional price caps to address strategies involving the laundry of power and to avoid limitation on bids in the ISO markets, and has recently asked FERC to extend those regional protection measures. Fourth, the ISO leveled penalties on suppliers who have withheld energy, even when we instructed them to provide it to avert blackouts. Five, the ISO referred other matters involving questionable activities by suppliers to FERC for their review and further action. And six, the ISO issued directives to participants in its markets identifying trading practices, included those in the cited Enron memos, that the ISO considered these contrary to market rules and would subject a trader employing them to sanctions. The ISO's interaction with Pro Systems, which has recently been the subject of press reports, represents an example of the ISO's effort in the past to protect its markets against manipulation. When the ISO was established in 1997, its first task was to oversee the development of the computer systems and software needed to run the electric grid and its energy markets. In March of 1997, the ISO contracted with the ISO Alliance a joint venture of Pro Systems and ABB Power T&D Company for the development of that computerized system. It should be noted that a few months after startup, Pro Systems withdrew from the ISO Alliance. It should also be understood the role that Pro Systems had in the development. They were not the market designers, they were not the code writers, that was ABB and their subcontractor, Ernst & Young, who did the actual code. Perot's responsibility was to integrate those systems and make sure that all of them worked together and that they had been tested out before we went live. As such, they gained considerable knowledge about the systems, but clearly they were not the ones writing the code. Um, the ISO demanded uh, in 1997, when we learned from a board member that there was marketing activity going on, uh, the ISO demanded that Pro, Pro Systems provide assurances that any service that it provided to market participants would employ only publicly available information, 
that it make the limitation clear to its potential customers and those that they may solicit in the future and that it enforce a what we call a Chinese wall so that those working at the ISO would not have contact with those who are doing the marketing activities. We never came to a resolution to that uh, discussion, but we determined that most of the material which they had uh, used, or at least the written material that we had seen, uh, in fact was publicly available material. We have reviewed that uh, material and chose not to continue uh, a discussion with Perot uh, on those items. Uh, however, with some of the recent information we've had made available to us, we are certainly going back and looking at those activities. The most effective means of deterring the exercise of bark and Mr. power. Mr. Winter? Yes. Uh, you're a minute over. How long? Mu oh. How much more you got? I've just got one more paragraph. Please continue. The most effective means of deterring uh, market power and unfair gaming is, of course, establishing the correct market rules. And we feel that we have done that with our uh, recent market design, which was approved by FERC. They also gave us some mit mitigation control uh, items that we think will uh, tend to buffer those. Most important of that is a must offer west wide so that you don't have the activities going from out of state versus power that's produced in state and with that I will uh, come to a close and then if you ask me questions about what Congress can do I'd be happy to tell you but it's in my testimony thank you thank you mr. winner dr. Sacchetti for five minutes please thank you congressman OC uh, first let me express my pleasure at appearing before the committee I follow electricity matters and I've done so for more than 30 years I'm very aware of the so-called California electricity crisis in fact, I've served at uh, Governor Davis's invitation on the ISO's market advisory group, and I was principal author of the California State Audit Report on electricity de deregulation. I also worked for utilities in the Pacific Northwest that sold power that kept the lights on during the energy crisis. The Navajo Nation that supplies power and, and coal to uh, California, and most recently, Perot Systems that has been accused of training energy companies in the art of gaming the California market. Let me begin by explaining why people confuse several electricity market matters and in the process fail to recognize that each is quite different. I think part of the confusion comes from the fact that all three of these terms that I'm going to go through include the word market. First, there are market forces. These include supply, namely, did California build enough generation? Demand. Did anyone forecast spectacular economic and growth in California, particularly in the high-tech areas? And the prices for inputs, a five-fold increase in natural gas prices nationally and a 30-fold in increase in California, as well as a 20-fold increase in pollution compliance cost. The answers to the supply and demand questions were both no. That is, we didn't get supply and demand right in California. Worse, the climate shift in the West made supply shortages 10 to 20 percent worse than they otherwise would have been. That's 5 to 8,000 megawatts. And the input cost in California alone associated with natural gas would have made the price of electricity $1,000 in, in late 2000. In addition to market forces, there's market power. Economists define market power as the ability of one seller or an illegal conspiracy of several sellers to withhold supply to force up prices, or alternatively, buyers acting in a similar manner to cause prices to fall. The issue is straightforward and is related to moving all prices in the entire relevant market. Despite the claims to the contrary, in my work for the State Audit Report, I found no example of market power abuse in the, in the sense of withholding supply from the entire California market. The third issue is called market gaming or market manipulation. This refers to individual market participants engaging in various actions, mostly contrary to the overall market. Gamers don't try to move the full market. Instead, they seek profits from anticipating the moves of others and, in effect, betting against the overall, overall market. This is an offensive game. Gaming works best when it's applied individually, not collectively. In the games in which everybody moves the same way, it's simply equivalent of a horse race where everybody bets on the same horse. 
in which case nobody wins but the horse and the house that controls the betting uh, arena. Of the three, market forces just can't be legislated by laws of regulation or by laws of Congress. Any attempts to regulate markets almost always fail, and it's utterly futile to try to attempt to control market forces. Market power is and should be closely regulated, and the potential for actual antitrust violations should be vigorously pursued and enforced. The third issue, gaming. This word is very much often confused. Essentially, all commodity markets are gamed. The issue is whether or not the games are within the rules or whether they are attempts to frustrate the rules and end run around the rules. Those kinds of activities need to be fixed. And indeed, in the California design, the whole market surveillance process was put in place in order to inform decision makers on how to fix and refine the market rules uh, based upon the actions of, of the gamers in the market. Let me turn now to Pro Systems. I've repaired a report that I've submitted as part of this testimony today. My conclusions are explained in that report, and I repeat them here just for emphasis. The facts are, as I viewed them, are that in 1997 and 1998, Pro Systems offered to provide training to participants in the new California power market based on public information employing the accepted principles of game theory, that is, operating within the rules. No market participants, however, were interested in this training. In late 2000, competitive market forces, the kind that I described earlier, combined with structural flaws in the design of the California market, as well as a series of regulatory and political missteps, caused the California en energy crisis. Allegations that Pro Systems was in any way responsible for this crisis are, in my opinion, totally unfounded, as I explained to the California Senate Committee. What happened in California in 2000 and 2001 could not have reasonably been anticipated in 1997 and 1998 when Pro System was marketing its training services. The strategies employed by Enron and other market participants evolved in quite a different set of circumstances than when Pro System was making its presentations. There's nothing in any of those documents that I reviewed that would come even remotely close to supporting the allegations where people have attempted to link Pro Systems to the California energy crisis. I'll be happy to answer any questions that you might have on this or any other subject. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sacchetti. Dr. Bacchus, for five minutes. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, and thank you. My name is Dr. George Backus. I am the president of Policy Assessment Corporation of Denver, Colorado. I was originally a nuclear design safety engineer, providing simulations to make sure that nuclear facilities remain safe and secure under all possible events. I trained under the simulationists who helped ensure the success of the Apollo space program using the same methods. My degree is in system dynamics, which primarily considers how physical or economic systems change over time as a result of human behavior. I focus on policy assessment. I simulate potential behaviors and failure modes as and how to modify the policies to ensure the desired results. In 1978, I co-authored the Fossil II simulation model used by DOE for U.S. national energy policy, including oil and gas regulation. I later extended that work to look at state and regional energy and utility planning. I currently focus on stress testing potential climate change policies for various governments. In 1986, for the state of Illinois, I looked at potential electric utility regulation and found some discouraging dynamics, much like what has now been experienced in California and elsewhere. In 1996, I prepared a report for the US DOE on the dynamics of deregulation. That report was based on the deregulation experience in the UK and elsewhere and showed that the US was now heading for the same problems. I presented the results to the Western System Coordinating Council in 1996. I then provided a workshop to the Western Interstate Energy Board, whose members are all the commissions within WSCC. I also made a presentation to the California Energy Commission and offered to make pre uh, presentations to the California PX, ISO, and CPUC. I then made presentations to trade groups, power authorities, consumer groups, utilities, and commissions throughout the US as I saw the same misguided deregulation efforts appear in the Midwest, New England, ERCOT, et cetera. 
The California approach to deregulation was much worse than any I had seen or imagined. It would obviously destroy the distribution companies and make the supply market a chaotic nightmare. I saw my simulation skills as presenting a consulting opportunity. In 1997, I assisted Southern California Edison, who had seen my WSCC presentation, to review potential California market rules for problems as well as to recommend alternatives that would alleviate those problems. At Edison, I was introduced to Haymont Lowell of Perot Systems, who saw the broad applicability of my work. We decided that combining Perot Systems' IT expertise with my work would provide a capability unavailable anywhere else. The product could be offered to market operators, commissions, and market participants worldwide. It would allow them to understand the market dynamics and plan accordingly. Perot felt the obvious place to start the effort was in California, and specifically with Edison because we were already there. These efforts included no proprietary information or data. I had no confidential data of any kind related to California or any other markets. All information was obtained from published reports and news articles. I never advised anyone to do anything unethical or illegal. I made sure everyone was aware of the system's problems so that the problems could be addressed, hopefully with my consulting assistance. Unfortunately, no such consulting business materialized in California. The fundamental problem in California is that it violated the basic concepts of economics. Ordinarily, supply and demand will come into balance orchestrated by price. Some key problems were that the California market did not let consumers see the market prices. The distribution companies were forced to buy independent of the prices. It would take 30 to 60 days before the ISO and PX could tell distribution companies and suppliers the accounting results, and thus there was no market transparency. Further on the supply side, citing rules precluded needed additional supply. Stranded cost agreements initially suppressed market prices, further discouraging adequate supply. On the demand side, the negotiated reduced consumer prices stimulated demand. Confronted with high demand and low supply, the market was incapable of achieving balance. This precipitated the crisis. The fatal flaws come not only from the mistakes in market design, but also from not planning for them and in letting the problems perpetuate. Public documents show that the ISO and PX were aware of many of the problems. Many academic investigators demonstrated the problems and proposed solutions. While it is easy to cast the blame on the market rules, it is the regulatory process that needs to be recognized as the crux of the California crisis. The problems and solutions I discussed in my written testimony will be revisited until regulators recognize that markets are imperfect and that they must plan ahead to accommodate those limitations. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Backus. Our last witness is Dr. Gribick for five minutes. Oh, thank you. Thanks. <laughs> okay. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. My name is Paul Gribick. As you know, I have experience in and am familiar with the California energy markets. Much of this knowledge stems from my employment with Pro Systems Corporation. I began working for Perot Systems as an associate in May of 1995 and remained employed there until January 2001. I was hired to provide consulting to clients on energy market matters, which later included the California ISO and PX. In March of 1997, Perot Systems joined with ABB to create the ISO Alliance. Perot was the project manager and computer systems integrator and ABB created the ISO's computer system. Pro was not responsible for drafting the ISO's protocol, nor was I. My job at the Alliance was to explain the formulation of the congestion management problem that resulted from the public WAPEX process to the computer programmers. I also read other public protocols issued by the ISO to advise the computer programmers, when asked, as to how the related elements of the market were supposed to work. I also participated in open meetings held by ISO where the progress in implementing the public protocols was discussed. I left the ISO Alliance team in September 1997 to provide part-time assistance to the PX. At the PX, I reviewed the ISO and PX public protocols so I could advise the PX on ways to ensure that their markets would work with ISOs. In addition, at the PX's direction, I interacted with market participants. Outside of my work for the ISO and PX, I only recall having contact with two market participants through marketing efforts by Perot Systems. 
The first meeting that I attended was with Southern California Edison in early 1997. I did not set this meeting up, give a presentation there, or write or create any, any document that was given to Edison. In October of 1997, I prepared a document for and participated in a presentation to San Diego Gas and Electric. I discussed the California energy market structure and the gaming process a participant would need to employ to make strategic decisions. When I use the word game or gaming, I am referring to a strategic decision-making process whereby different strategies are used to determine the risks and benefits each strategy may present to this, given the strategies that other participants may employ. Of course, these strategies must comply with certain market rules. It later came to my attention that someone at San Diego Gas and Electric misunderstood some of the things I said in the presentation and told the ISO that we were talking about proprietary information. That was not the case. At no time did I offer to disclose nor disclose any ISO or PX proprietary information. At a meeting, uh, pardon me, a meeting with Enron was set for January 13, 1998 but it did not occur due to a severe snowstorm. I do not recall participating in any subsequent meeting with Enron, and I never made a presentation to Enron. These marketing efforts, about which much has been made, resulted in no consulting work from any market participant. I believe that we were not hired by anyone because we were offering nothing more than a way to analyze the market and our knowledge of the public protocols, nothing particularly unique. Much of the misunderstanding about the marketing efforts in which I and others at Perot engaged stems from the 44-page document that Reliant Energy turned over to the California Senate. The facts surrounding this document are laid out in my full statement, but basically this document was never presented to anyone. It was not a blueprint for any type of illegal trading. It was created after the markets opened on April 1, 1998, and I have no idea how the document made it to Reliant Energy's files. The examples of flaws in the protocols that appear in the 44-page document regarding the real-time market and negative price problems are two of the problems I brought to the ISOs and PX's attention. I also brought an additional problem to the ISOs with the ISOs default usage charge to their attention. All three of these were fixed before the markets opened. I recommended that the protocols be revised to address these problems because I believe they could ena have enabled a single market participant to create instability in the market. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, I am a California resident and have paid more for my electricity and suffered the same inconveniences that other California residents have encountered. I can assure you, however, and the facts show that neither my nor Perot Systems' work contributed in any way, shape, or form to high energy prices, brownouts, or blackouts, or other aspects of the California energy crisis. Thank you, and I will do my best to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Dr. Gribbick. All right. We're going to start sorting through some of this stuff here. Uh, Mr. Winter. This discussion about <clears throat> Pro Systems contract and contractual constraints with the ISO. I know there was a bunch of correspondence back and forth. If I want to make I want to make sure I get the time frame correct, Pro Systems and their subcontractors worked with ISO and PX on the uh, melding of the software systems in what time frame? Okay, let me let me just run back through the chronology. Uh, first off, the PX and the ISO were sep separated right. as two entities, so we have to keep those ideas kind of straight in our head too. Uh, the ISO signed a contract with the Alliance in March of 1997. They then began the development of the software systems, and it was in September, late September, early October, that we learned of the Perot activities. Now, all of the... Just a second. So ABB and Ernst & Young, from March of 97 to September, October of 97, had worked on the software packages. Correct. And okay. Perot was part of the alliance. All right. Now, their responsibility was to take... Uh, there were actually three major systems. Uh, 
the, the settlement system which Ernst and Young had developed. There was an energy management system that was developed on a on another contract with ABB, and then there was the scheduling and and uh, uh, pricing. Uh, system that ABB developed. Well, those three all had to be integrated together and tested so that it worked as one complete total system. And that was Perot's job, was to make sure that testing was completed and that the systems all uh, worked appropriately. They worked up until uh, the start date was April of 1999, April 1st, March 31st. And then uh, their work, in essence, after they did the integration, was completed, and then they left the, uh, the alliance contract in June or July of that 1998. So from August or September of 97 to some point prior to April 1st of 98, Perot was working to integrate the software so they could communicate, and they were checking for its operational efficiency and if there were flaws, what were they supposed to do with the information? Well, what we had was we had variances that we identified. And any time something didn't connect, then we would write up a variance. And they were then responsible for getting back with Ernst & Young or ABB and correcting the code to make sure that it did work. Did Perot do the code adjustments, or did somebody else do the code adjustments? I believe that ABB and Ernst and & Young did the adjustments, but certainly they were working very closely with Perot to, to make sure that it would then work out in the testing procedures. Who had physical control of the code? Uh, at that time, uh, ABB and Ernst and & Young would have physical control of the code. I do not know, but I would assume that Perot also had the soft, or the, uh, uh, code words to get in so that they could change it if, if it was deemed necessary. But there, we had a process in place where uh, any changes would be recorded so that everyone knew what, was, uh, what had been changed. Changes recorded. Changes were recorded then, and the person doing the change would have to log on, put their personal identification in there so you knew who had access and who was doing the change? At that time, I don't know whether there were personal or whether there were, quote, blanket codes, because we were not operational. Now, when we went operational in, on March 31st, we did what we called a lockdown of the system, and we went in and changed all the codes so that we then had absolute control of who was coming in and what changes they were making. Well, one of the things I'm trying to get at is whether or not Perot systems had possession or access to the code. And I, if I heard you correctly, you said you don't know. You're correct. I don't know. I, I would be very surprised if they didn't have access to the, to the code because as the tester, they had to review it and see how it all fit together. Did your contract with ABB or Ernst & Young allow for the code to be shared with other contractors? Uh, when you say other contractors, we had confidentiality in there. If it was another contractor working for the development of the system, then yes, it would have been able to be shared. Would they have to come back to the ISO to get sign-off from ISO or the PX, in the case of the PX, for sharing that code with another contractor under the confidentiality agreement? I don't know. My, my guess would be that as long as it was, it was the alliance, in other words, Ernst & Young, ABB, or Pro Systems, they would not. If it went beyond that, then yes, because then you get into the proprietary of software systems. Was a record made of the code changes that occurred from August or September until going live on March 31st? There was certainly a variance a, a record made of any time that we had the actual code changes. I do not know whether there was a documentation of each individual line change that may have been made. When you say variance, do you mean you know, the code is X, it's not complying with what we need, so it varies from what we want? And we need to fix this. Correct. We had those um, 1,045 variances that we had found that needed correction. 1,045. Right. All right. And ABB and Ernst and Young were charged with correcting those variances. That is correct. Would it be? Act, I'm, one of the things I just love about elective offices, the <laughs> wordsmithing. 
variances, is that the same as saying there were flaws in the system? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, now, when Perot, Perot's work with the Alliance ended when you went live on March 31? Uh, no, they continued. When you go live, you find things that you didn't uh, know were broken. So uh, they had to finish their reports, uh, and they finally left then in about July of 98. July of 98, okay. Now, you had a bunch of correspondence back and forth with Perot Systems in the fall, late fall of 97. Yes, we did. About the attempts to market the uh, information that they were marketing. If I heard you correctly today, uh, I think your testimony is that you never signed off on the fifth or sixth letter exchange saying, go ahead and do it. Did you ever affirmatively say, don't do it? No, we did not. When we looked at the information that was available to us, they, in fact, were not using anything that was confidential. Uh, however, the contract does state that the uh, parties to the contract would not do anything that would give the perception of impropriety. And we certainly felt that out uh, marketing as a knowledgeable person, ways to beat the system was not quite appropriate. Of course, they didn't do a very good job marketing it, did they? <laughs> so, now the the correspondence that went back and forth. I know there was a discussion about the Chinese wall issue between people who were attempting to market the program to third parties and the people who were actually working with ISO and PX. There was a uh, a disclaimer requirement. There was a letter to all clients about the uh, existence of the ethics wall and the like, were there things that you asked for that Perot did not do in this correspondence? Uh, yes, we initially had asked that they uh, cease and desist from their marketing efforts. Uh, later on, when we couldn't show that it was any uh, confidential information that they were providing, then we backed off from that position and just asked for a Chinese wall and disclaimer so that no one would uh, think that they were getting some secret information out of the uh, development of the ISO systems. And presumably that was accomplished? They uh, told us that they were doing that, yes. Okay. Dr. Backus, uh, on your computer model for the, uh, actually, I, I have a more interesting question from my perspective. In a commodity business, do you find it unusual that participants participate in a, or construct a game model or a gaming algorithm? I take, that as being a, I take that as being a rather common exercise where a person our company always goes to the exercise. If it's a car manufacturer, should we have zero interest loans to stimulate uh, demand uh, at a given time? Uh, I would, to my knowledge, essentially all commodities, all industries involved with commodities have a strategic planning organization or a marketing organization that tries to figure out how to do as best they can in the market compared to their competitors. And that process, as Paul has pointed out, is what we call gaming sort of like what Beautiful Mind was in, in the show with John Nash, and uh, goes clear back to uh, Antoine Carnot in 1850. So whether it's, well, being on the Agricultural Committee, whether it's rice or wheat or corn or soybeans, you have participants in those markets who presumably are factoring into their analysis, weather and transportation and price variances and supply and, you know, number of railroad cars and... Yes, given that my family is all farmers originally, the answer is yes. You always decide whether you wanted to hold the grain until it was midwinter or whether you wanted to dump it on the market early. So even as individual farmers, they in a sense were doing gaming. All right. Now your computer model, when did you create it? 
actually was created, uh, the original work was created for the U.S. Department of Energy as the fossil two model that was used for oil and gas deregulation and starting in 1978 and used for policy through 1998. The first time that it was used and it was a slightly modified version was for the state of Illinois who developed the model to take a look at deregulation in Illinois in 1986 because at that time is when the new nuclear plants were going to come on and they were worried about uh, Price is going up by a factor of three as the price shock to see whether deregulation would help out that process. It didn't go very far, but nonetheless, that model already showed the dynamics in quite good detail of what actually happened as we progressed both in the UK and in the United States. How did you go about getting the algorithm figured out for your model? Um, it's almost funny to me because we're the only ones who still use it and the idea is if you're going to deregulate electricity then why don't you treat it as a deregulated market where prices attempt to clear and that people don't have perfect information because most park markets aren't perfect prior to that and I would guess it's still very much today and I guess I know that everybody uses these very sophisticated optimization models that assume there's a perfect market just like was assumed and could be assumed under the centralized command and control of the regulated markets so the only thing that we added to this is to say well it worked for gas and it worked for oil why don't we apply the same algorithm for electricity and see what happens and what happened uh, because electricity is not stored very well, uh, it ends up that you can have very, very volatile markets. A second part of this is that even when we talk about deregulating oil and gas, we tend to have a few rather large companies that actually stabilize the market and a lot of niche players. In the United States, probably still today, we have 4,500 electric utility players if we take and add together all the public powers and such. The market is in no shape whatsoever to be a deregulated market. So what the model first showed is that we've got to have a lot of mergers and acquisitions. It also showed that during that process that would be quite disruptive, which would also mean that, that people wouldn't know what supply and demand actually meant in that side of as a customer, who am I buying from today or tomorrow? In fact, it's probably not on like buying internet services in the last couple of years where you don't know whether the person's going to be there or not the next day. So the, if I understand you correctly, the unique feature of your algorithm was the factor accounting for the inability to store electricity. That certainly showed up as a dominant characteristic that made things worse. The biggest thing was just a change in assumptions that now that we had a deregulated market, we would have an imperfect world where people were trying to make the best choices they could and in a sense would have to make them in a hurry because we don't have the storage. The biggest fault that I find with the current regulatory work and the past regulatory work is that the tools that were used for that analysis continue to assume an optimization approach only appropriate to a regulated market. And that's what I considered as a major failure in trying to assess what would be the impacts of deregulation, both within California, New England, wherever. How did you account in your model for the initial 60 or 90 day lag in price transparency? Um, I didn't consider the 60 or 90 days. It was just the concept that I would bid and I wouldn't know what the price was until after everything was done. My model actually only runs at a semi-annual or annual level, so it's not worried about market day-to-day -day transactions. It's simply the idea of trying to deal with the idea that you don't really know what prices are, and you as a consumer or as a generator have to make a decision without having price transparency. Now, you acted as a consultant under, is it policy assessment? Yes. To Perot Systems. Um, I would say the answer to that is no. Since we simply had a joint marketing effort, that if it was successful, my understanding of how systems worked would be combined with their IT capabilities and that we'd be able to offer a joint product to uh, participants, whether they're commissions or the ISO or utilities, on how to best survive within that market. So your joint venture started when? Um, it would be, I would say, mid or early 97. It's whatever time I met uh, Haymont while I was working at Edison or doing consulting at Edison. In 1996, you gave a presentation to the Western System, Western System Coordinating Council. Who was in attendance and what did the presentation entail? Uh, my guess is there's something like, I'm guessing here, 1,200 people. To my knowledge, every utility and commission and can you, name them? Can you name them for us? Sorry, I've sort of missed all of those. So they were all there, and the presentation is basically identical to the presentations that you probably see in the data that's on the Pura website, which was provided to Senator Dunn. Um, in that sense, I'm sort of one-trick pony that the 1996 report I provided by DOE lays out in very fine detail 
all the different dynamics that are going to occur and how they will evolve if people aren't careful. And as it turned out, nobody was careful. So in 96, you made a presentation to the Western You made a presentation to the Western States Coordinating Council, basically describing these uh, potential flaws in the market. Simply the dynamics of deregulation, which just simply said if you follow the deregulation process as was followed in the UK and South America and New Zealand, which the United States was also following, here are the problems you're going to find. And those problems included mergers that started up about that time, uh, massive divestitures of the different utilities which we saw where they broke into their different generating and distribution groups, and certainly market gaming, and then something called re-regulation that we're probably talking about right now. Now, you gave um, a second series of presentations in 97 and 98 on this material. I was probably giving presentations continuously, probably to hundreds of organizations, almost all identical. Did they track the presentation you made to the Western States Coordinating Council? Yes, they did. In fact, it was quite nice to do so because as time was marching on, 100% of the forecasts that I had produced as to where the problems would be, what would occur next, were actually occurring exactly in the sequence and timing that I had predicted. Now, in your presentation to the Western States Council, you mention a game that includes uh, a generator having an outage on one of its units in order to drive up the price for all other units. Yes. Uh, I guess the question we would have is whether you were advocating such a game in your presentations. No, certainly not. It was simply to present that and possibly 20 or other um, games as well that had occurred in the UK, including discussions of how to prevent those games from occurring. Again, that particular game was developed by Antoine Carnot in 1850, roughly, and is taught in every university in the United States, so it wasn't like a secret. So your, your testimony is that you were analytical in your presentation rather than advocational. Certainly, in all cases, it was simply to point out here is the situation and that both utilities and commissions must recognize that, because certainly the people who are hurt very significantly would be people like Edison and PG&E if those prices went up. So it was appropriate that both commissions, regulators, and the utilities and market participants understood that problem could exist. Now, you state in your testimony that the outage problem was a particular weakness in the California market design. It was particularly troublesome simply because supply and demand were so out of balance, as Mr. Winters has pointed out. Is this the same? This is something you'd also recognized in the UK system? Yes, it was. Now, did you, having recognized this, uh, did you inform the Cal ISO or the PUC or the PX of this problem? I tried to inform the California Energy Commission of that and certainly had the presentation at, uh, in 1996 also to the Western Interstate Energy Board, which is all of the commissions. Uh, I only had limited contact with the PX and ISO, and they were up to their gills or necks in trying to get the system put up, so they weren't interested in listening to me. Um, any contact that I tried to have with the CPUC, um, that was didn't get anywhere either because they were busy trying to work with the different uh, utilities to try to also get the system up and running. Okay, I have an, I have an email uh, from you to Dr. Gribbick, dated May 8th of 97. Just a minute here while I get organized. I have an email from you to Dr. Gribbick dated May 8th, 97. I'm going to uh, ask the clerk to take this down to you, please. Do you have it? Okay, it's up on the screen, excuse me. You probably can't read it from here. <laughs> please take this down to uh, Dr. Backus. And in that email, you state, quote, I'm actually trying to get the CPUC, which is the California Public Utilities Commission, to recognize the mess they are causing with their pricing and marketing rules and relieve some of the restrictions so that the market can actually behave like a market. First, I want to ask you, is that your email? Yes, it is. What was the mess that you refer to that the CPUC was causing? I had already been looking at the potential rules that were being developed for Southern California Edison. And within those rules, I looked at it already at that time the point where you said it's a 99.999 probability, it said that 
Edison, SDG&E, unless it got out of business, and PG&E would go bankrupt. It also said that because of the way the uh, stranded costs were put in place, that initially the prices would be too low to stimulate supply. Therefore, it gave with almost absolute certainty that the market would start to fall apart by 1999, which I should point out in my WSCC presentation said that is when we should be having this hearing now, should have been in 1999 rather than to have waited this long. I wasn't chairman then. You're forgiven, thank you. <laughs> Mr. Winter, let me ask you a couple questions here. If I, I want to read you a couple quotes, and I just, uh, I'm obviously I'm confused here. I hear testimony about structural issues, and I've seen the quotes about supply issues, and I've seen the quotes about uh, abatement and conservation and all that. I'm frankly I'm a little bit con confused. And I'm trying to determine whether or not we had sufficient supply or insufficient supply, or whether it was market structure or flaws in the market structure or something else. I want to, I guess I would ask you just extemporaneously for a abbreviated response to that. Was it, was it a, uh, issue of supply, was it an issue of declining conservation, was it an issue of market structure? I mean, looking back, trying to avoid repeating this in the future, and I'm going to ask all the witnesses the same question. What's your input here? Well, my input is uh, twofold. One is, clearly, uh, if you don't have enough supply, the markets aren't going to work and the prices are going up. Now, that's the way markets are supposed to work because then that encourages people to add generation. I think in California, uh, because those signals were so, so uh, distorted that people were trying to guess whether there was a supply or, or not supply shortage. And that combined, uh, I, I think it's kind of interesting that we had our outages not during the summer when we had high loads, but during the winter when we had actually reduced loads. And so people want to read the nameplate ratings of all the, all the generators in the area and say, obviously, we had plenty of power during that time frame. As an operator, I don't care what the nameplate rating is. I'm interested in how many units are on and what's going to be my supply that day. Just, for, just the nameplate rating is when you look at the turbine, it's got the bra little brass plate on there. It says, at this and at such and such an input, this is the megawattage generated therefrom. Right. It has a right. unit that says it's, you know, five megawatts or 500 okay. megawatts, whatever. But. Uh, there are so many restrictions on generators. One is a maintenance uh, unit is out for maintenance or it has tube leaks so it can only generate half. Uh, units are out because uh, the owners are financially incapable of buying natural gas. Uh, certainly in the Northwest, one of the other things to remember about California is when people look at the supply, they tend to focus on just the power in California. Well, California has always imported 20 to 30 percent of its power from outside the, the state. So you've got to look at what's the availability at out of the state. So structurally, when the PUC forced the investor-owned utilities to buy all their, their energy from the uh, day-ahead market, they really eliminated their ability to make long-term contracts and go outside the state and in the state and tie up power. So uh, as I look at it, that, that was a structural flaw. Then you start buying in real time and not taking into account uh, maintenance, droughts, uh, all the other things, a lack of conservation, no demand side uh, transparency of the price, no demand and supply equilibrium being developed. Uh, you have a, a horrible situation. Dr. Sicchetti, how about you have any input on that? As I said in my... You need to turn it on. There you go. As I said in my opening statement, uh, all three of the factors, supply and demand or market forces, market structural design flaws, and a form of market manipulation or gaming, all three of those were present in 2000, 2001 in California. On the supply side, 
people just didn't build fast enough, but mostly because the models were all forecasting need in 2001, 2002. And so supply was in the works, but it wasn't to come online until about 2002. Uh, what made things worse was that the economy in California grew much more rapidly in the late 90s than anticipated. We had a return of the California miracle. And we also had new buildings and new uh, electronic communications and, and high-tech industries uh, have a big surge in demand. So demand was way up, and people just quite frankly missed that, uh, that, that fact. But this, the most important thing that caused supply and demand problems in 2000 had to do with the weather. In the West, about once every 30 years, it's very uh, dry in the north and, and hot in the south. Normally when it's dry in the north, it's cooler in the south, and when it's wet in the north, it's hot in the south. This year is a typical year for the west. It's dry in the north and has been dry in the north, and it's a cool summer in California. All of us, uh, with the exception of that one week back in Sacramento uh, in San Francisco about 10 days ago, uh, look at the numbers and say Southern California and most of the southwest is much cooler than normal because it's a dry year. That's the normal condition. Well. This is not just some kind of quirk, because uh, when you can't import the hydroelectricity from the north, and it's very hot in the south, and therefore air conditioning is are running, what happens is in, in, in the year 2000, the summer and spring of 2000, there was a, effectively about an 8,000 megawatt hours of shortage created by the weather. The California market's 40,000 megawatts on peak conditions, more or less. So 8,000 megawatts is 20% shortfall. That was the big factor that caused the initial problem in the spring and summer of 2000. Up to that point, the California markets were oversupplied, and prices under deregulation were much lower than they had been under regulation. In fact, when California deregulated in 1998, there was a 30 percent excess supply, and the price the first two years of California deregulation was half of what it had been under regulation. And everybody was claiming credit for designing this wonderful system that produced prices, half of what they had been previously. And this was a, a, an incredible uh, success story. But when that weather changed, coupled with not building the supply fast enough and not forecasting the demand growth soon enough, those things created a, the equivalent of the perfect supply and demand storm, which made prices jump dramatically. And in the process, it, uh, it pointed to the structural design flaw problems that I also mentioned. Uh, Mr. Winter just talked about one of them. That's the issue of having uh, no long-term contracts and requiring the utilities to divest. California was the only market in the world that went to deregulation with virtually 100 percent of its energy to be sold in the spot market. Every other part of the world may put maybe 10 or 15 percent of its energy into the commodity or spot market. California put more than 90 percent. Today, when California prices are once again stabilized and low, we have only 10 percent in the spot market. Back in 2000, we had 90-some-odd percent of all the energy was in the spot market by design. People at the time said that was foolish, silly to do, but California did it anyway. Another structural design flaw we had was we denied the ability of retail customers to get price signals. This caused demand to be high until the governor convinced people there was an energy emergency, and then he talked people into conservation. But there were no price signals that anybody in California paid uh, during 2000. In fact, California retail prices, except for San Diego, were not raised until March of 2001, well after the, uh, the height of the energy crisis that began back in May of 2000. So that was a second design flaw. Let me go to Dr. Ba Backus here. Dr. Backus, do you have anything as it relates to the interrelationship uh, on this question. Is, it, is this an issue of supply? Is it market structure? Is it lack of conservation? I mean, I will always argue that it, in a sense, is market structure. And to actually step back a ways and say that whenever you design anything, say, from an engineering perspective, you will always include contingency planning, and you always stress test that system before you implement it in the real world. And even yet today, for the original rules that were made for the market in California, and my guess is that even today that there has not been a formal process by which 
that those rules have been tested on a computer, just as we would in a Apollo spacecraft, to make sure that it can withstand all the things the market's going to throw at it. And I think that's a major failing of how we take a look at uh, determining market structures in deregulation, whether it be in California or any place in the United States. Dr. Gribbick. I, I think uh, Dr. Schicchetti gave a masterful summary of the problems. Uh, uh, there are a few things I might add. Uh, one, uh, the utilities were forced to buy out of the spot markets, which could be extremely volatile. But then they had to sell to their customers at a fixed price. The price signals were never being passed through to the end user. So uh, they, they had no incentive to conserve whenever supply got short. Their price was fixed. Um, and as Dr. Baca said, uh, it was very foolish, I believe, to design such a complicated system from scratch with a lot of different compromises being made, building the systems to implement it, and only testing to make sure that the systems talk to each other, that they, you put numbers in, you got the numbers out you expected. No one ever sat down and said, let's simulate the operation of this market. Let's actually have teams of people uh, play the roles of various uh, market participants, see how they, this thing will actually play out. Give them rewards. See if they can see what ty types of strategies people will employ. If we did that, we might have been able to find some of the more egregious flaws and fix them before we actually went live with this. I thought it was a rather uh, a bit of insanity to turn over a multi-billion dollar segment of a state's economy to uh, a market design which essentially was untested. If, if I might just be so bold, I, I want to ask you each a yes or no question. Oh, it's dangerous up here. But, uh, to those who would contend that this was simply a matter of supply, my question of each of the witnesses, and I'll go from Dr. Gribbick to Mr. Winter. To those who would continue to contend that this was simply a matter of supply, would you agree or disagree? I don't think I would agree with just supply. That's my question. Yes, I, so I'd say no. Dr. Backus? I'd say, say no with big neon lights on it. Dr. Sacchetti? More than supply. It was more than supply, or Mr. a lack of supply. Mr. Winter? More than supply. Okay. I want to recognize my friend from Cleveland for 10 minutes. I want to thank the chair for calling this hearing and certainly our responsibilities as an oversight committee uh, become very important when we look at what happened in California with the uh, manipulation of the energy market. So I appreciate uh, the chair's calling the hearing and I appreciate the witnesses who are here today. And I have some questions that I'd uh, like to ask the witnesses and in particular uh, start with Dr. Backus. And if a yes or no answer would suffice, that would be fine, and we can just move from there. Uh, Dr. Backus, how many meetings did, uh, did you or Perot Systems hold with Enron? Uh, Perot Systems held none with Enron. I made two presentations. The first was to the customers of Enron. It was made at Palm Springs. I think it's in the Perot uh, website. And I would guess that that would have been late 96 maybe very, probably late 96 would be my guess. And then I also made the same presentation, exactly the pre same presentation, to Enron again up at their Portland office. So it was basically, which in both of those presentations are basically just replications of the WSCC, WSCC presentation with some minor updates for the latest breaking news as to how that presentation in 1996 was playing out as advertised. And who attended these meetings? Um, at the first meeting, uh, it would, there were just several customers there. I didn't keep track of, of all of them. In fact, I kept track of none of the, the customers there. NCPA was the only one I remember, Northern California Power Agency, because they later invited me back to again go through the process with their members in that regard. Certainly, there were some uh, executives of uh, Enron there as well. And in fact, one of them, and I'm trying to remember his name, Rich Davis, I'm trying to remember which the name is, uh, who was there and who then invited me out to his uh, organization out in Portland to make that presentation. Do, do you have any notes or, uh, that, of the meetings? Did you take notes at the meetings? No, I was just making the presentation, coming in and leaving. 
So there's no notes that I have. Did people have any questions at the, at the hearing, at the meetings? Uh, yes, certainly people were worried that this was going to happen, and my answer to them was yes, uh, that most of these things were going to happen. Uh, uh, that the problems would occur, that the market did have problems. Uh, for the Enron, originally, as Paul's pointed out, the original Enron meeting was supposed to be a proposal to uh, Enron, similar to that made for Southern California Edison. Uh, that did not uh, take place about that time, is my understanding, is when Pro felt that they were going to get the new contract and therefore really did have a conflict of interest problem and decided that that had to stop. Before I came to Congress, I used to do marketing strategies, and I just am curious, when you meet with a client, you make a presentation. You mean to tell me after that presentation, your clients have questions or pros prospective client has a question and you don't take notes on that? In this particular case, no, because I knew it could go nowhere. And, and also in my case, Paul and I are sort of what we call the technical nerds of this. And certainly in the pro process, there was the vice president, uh, Ed Smith, who was the, uh, I guess, the worldwide vice president for energy marketing, and certainly Hamont Law, which I believe is the western states marketing. So those are, that's the four groups. So certainly the marketing process occurred elsewhere. Sure. Uh, when you say it would go nowhere, what do you mean? On my side, all I have is a simulation model that looks at things for, at a uh, at a plant type level, not even plants or plant units, that looks things at a semi-annual level, so it's good for strategic planning. The Portland office is a trading office, so there's absolutely nothing that I know or can do that relate to that group. Well, I, I, I'm missing something here. Uh, you're acknowledged to be an expert in marketing. You meet with individuals to, uh, for some purpose. It's not clear if you say it wouldn't go anywhere, why, uh, why, why were you meeting with them in the, as I in the made, first place? noted, I made hundreds of presentations, and I would get paid for those presentations. So I was paid a half day to simply make the presentation. Did, did you wonder why they wanted you to make a presentation? No, I did not, because most people did find my presentation to be quite outrageous, controversial, but sort of hit a chord saying... Well, I haven't, I haven't been asking questions here that long, so I can't say that yet. No, I'm saying that that's what, I, what I've, I found. And so basically people were coming back to me and say, we would like other people to hear this presentation because it's a real eye-opener and will change the way we think about deregulation, which was actually, in many cases, my function that I felt that that was something very useful. Well, how do people end up, uh, how, do end, how do people end up looking at it differently? Does that, I mean, does that mean that they suddenly discover that hey, there's a game here we can play. I don't think that is the response. Um, people like to argue that America runs on, American corporations run on fear and greed. I like to argue they only run on fear, that they're afraid of losing I their... I think there's been evidence in the last few weeks that... that that's true, I have to take We got both Sorry. of those covered. Part of that time I was naive. So the idea that, that most of these companies were very afraid of what was going to happen in the marketplace. And I think that's what dominated most of their concerns. So, so you were there to address their fears, and would you be surprised to learn that you also appealed to their greed? No, I would not be surprised at all. In fact, that I do believe that Enron, and certainly in those days, was considered as good a company as any other company in the sense of its, uh, its approach to business, that it also needed to understand that the old methods of, of, the, of the regulated market no longer apply it. They had to think differently about how the system would operate and that the experience that I had and was telling everybody uh, about how deregulated markets worked everywhere, including indications that they were going to work that way in the United States, that they needed to know that. Well, when, when you were in these meetings, uh, can you recall whether or not the participants discussed gaming or any gaming strategies? Certainly they discuss gaming. It's more the idea of a war story that it, almost everybody, it doesn't matter whether you're at the commission or wherever you are, that they want to hear about what happened in the UK. Now, in my regard there, I take it simply that I was reporting public information. There was no discussions there to say, uh, here's a game that you should do and that this is going to make you lots of money. It was merely saying, here is the full spectrum and here are all the problems that that caused. Did you discuss self-created congestion, for example? Certainly that was a line item already in the WSCC 1996 report that I already talked about. Well, let's talk about that for a moment. Let's, okay. let's recreate the discussion. Uh, you, you can be the, uh, the market strategist and, and I'll be Enron. Okay, what is this about self-created congestion? 
I don't think I ever received a question like that, being there much oh. smart, <laughs> smarter than that. And also when I said I'm not a market strategist, my work is designing simulation models. Huh. That is my expertise as an engineer. So certainly I would, not, given that I'm a one-person company... Well, let's talk for a moment about this simulation model of self-created congestion. Okay. Tell me about it. All I can tell you is that it exists in, California, in the UK, it exists in any system, and that all price differentials in the market occur across congestion. In my own work, just because of your interest... Do, do you want to translate that? Ah. Let's say I'm just a person that pays exorbitant electric rates, and I want to know how that happens. Do you want to translate that? Yes, if there is an abundant demand on one side of a transmission line that cannot, where all that load cannot be delivered by generation on that side, then the plants on the other side of the transmission line simply cannot deliver, and the price now must be determined on the side where the demand is, which could be a very high price because the outside is essentially an isolated market. And so that would be what causes basically prices to rise. 80% of the time, the WSCC is one market. The price is basically uniform everywhere. 20% of the time, there's usually congestion somewhere, either across the Rockies, where I am, or on Line 15, which is the north-south. Well, isn't, isn't the net effect of one of those uh, 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 self-created congestions is that uh, a company would get paid for moving energy to relieve congestion without actually moving any energy or relieving congestion? That is something I hadn't actually thought about trying to think. Uh, think about to, it right now. What do you yes, think? Yes. Now, the answer to that is correct. But again, that is a problem that I would argue with the ISO rules, that if the ISO had the ability to have dictated how that congestion would be to relieve, that it was actually part of the market, those problems could not have occurred. But isn't it also a possibility when you're talking about uh, creating congestion, self-created congestion, that uh, one effect of such an action would be to create the uh, appearance of congestion through overstating loads? The answer to that is yes, but I also have to again go back to the idea that I simply reported that all these things existed, reported it to everybody that it existed. For my own work in simulation, I do not have transmission lines, so I can't really simulate that other than in a broad sense to think about it. So it's merely me trying to tell everybody this is a problem that needs to be solved within the marketplace. It also is a rather obvious problem that prices change across transmissions. So again, it is not in any way informing people, especially traders who know much more about this than I do, uh, about how this process would work. But, uh, but your awareness of, uh, of the self-created congestion, are, are you aware now? that there is a symmetry between information, according to your testimony, that you presented and the memorandum that Enron's lawyers wrote about Enron's gaming activities with respect to their Death Star strategy, which was where Enron would get paid for moving energy to relieve congestion without actually moving any energy or relieving congestion, which you said can yes. occur, and their load shift strategy, which is an action to create the appearance of congestion. Yes, I would say roughly about 40 percent, maybe more, of the Enron games in the memorandum were included in my presentations. But again, those presentations were presented to everybody very early on, long before uh, the markets opened, in fact. And certainly that everybody knew about those. Uh, certainly you could get them from California, from the United Kingdom. And therefore the idea was to make sure everybody aware that those problems could be um, resolved in the sense that the ISO could certainly develop rules to prevent those things from happening. Uh, so in your view, you were, you were marketing knowledge of uh, or informing people of knowledge of uh, legal gaming as opposed to illegal gaming. I never made that distinction. I was simply reporting Thank all you. the things that happened. Right. I mean, that, that's important to, to, to state. Well, it, I, because in a way, you know, retrospectively, questions, Mr. Chairman, have been raised about whether or not uh, Enron's activities have, in, in effect, constituted a violation of law. That doesn't mean that you were coaching them to break the law, but it also represents the possibility that you were giving them information 
that they may have taken to create strategies that ran contrary to the law. I suppose anybody could pick up any textbook on economics and read the Cronau duopoly and come up with the same conclusion. It's always helpful, though, to find out the people who carry the textbook along and meet with individuals who then break the law. Which is why we try to talk to all the commissions uh, and to all the customers so that everybody knew that they needed to deal with this problem. Thank the gentleman. Let me ask a couple questions here. The, uh, Dr. Gribbick, the, I mean, the competitive, it's obvious what, I mean, if you have possession of the algorithms and the code that ISO and PX used in their systems, it would be a competitive advantage in terms of being able to draw the algorithm out and replicate it accordingly. Now, my question of you is, do you, did you know the Cal ISO's computer codes or algorithms? Actually, I did not have any access to the ISO's uh, computer codes nor their algorithms. Uh, what I had access to was the public protocols, the public tariffs, the public problem formulations that came out of the WAPEX process, where this is about WAPEX? WAPEX, the Western Power Exchange. It was the... Uh, Sorry, I just want to make sure we got that on the record. Okay. It, it was the uh, process that the IOU set up to uh, develop the initial set of protocols for the ISO and the PX. So I knew the problem formulations, which were in the public domain. I had no access to the ISO's... Uh, computer codes. I didn't know the algorithms. I believe those were considered proprietary by ABB and their subcontractors. All right. Did you have access to any proprietary information? If so, did you share it with other Pro Systems employees or other market participants? During the time uh, we were engaged in these marketing efforts, I know of no proprietary information that I had ever received. And I certainly didn't share any with uh, people outside since I don't know of any that I would have had. So your analyses and your proposals were based entirely on public information? Yes, I, would, I was uh, reading the public protocols and trying to decide what type of, uh, uh, how people would operate with them, see if I could find any uh, potential problems that I would alert the ISO and PX to. So for instance, the gentleman, uh, I or any of my colleagues in Congress, had we been schooled in this type of an analysis, could have gone and read the public protocols. Yes, I think you could have uh, gotten the public protocols, the documents which were exchanged in the WEPEX process freely. Uh, you could have seen how the problems were formulated, read it through, and you would, uh, if you were uh, schooled in the various fields of mathematics, you'd know as much as I would. Okay. So you got, you got probability analysis, you got algorithms, you've got all sorts of things. There's just, I want to make sure I understand this very carefully, and that is, you're telling me your analysis was based entirely upon public information. Yes, it was. All right. Dr. Backus, the input that you provided, your analysis provided to whomever your consultants were, was it based on public information in its entirety, or was there propri proprietary information included in your proposals and presentations? There was absolutely no proprietary information. It was all publicly available, well-known information. Were there other people who have been schooled in this uh, particular mathematical skill that you're aware of who were doing similar analyses to what you were doing? No, there was not, because everybody was assuming everything was perfect, whereas I started off with the position that things were maybe not so perfect. Dr. Gribbick, how about you? Um, let's see. I know, at least on one of the problems I identified and brought to the ISO, there was a problem with the way the real-time market was structured. I uh, went to the uh, ABB programmers who were developing the software for the real-time market, and I believe there was an ISO person there at the time, and outlined the problem I saw in the uh, ISO's protocols. And I was told by them 
that this process, uh, let's see, I think I notified them um, around May 1st of 97. I was told by them that this problem had been identified in the WAPEX process, that it had been discussed, and a solution had been developed for the problem, but that uh, somehow it fell through the cracks. And, and it was kind of surprising that uh, whenever, they, they told me that they would take care of it, it would be fixed, it was not my concern. I was surprised in uh, October 31st of 97, the ISO published a new set of protocols. I read them and I saw the same problem still was there. So I would say, yes, people knew about the problems, but one of the big problems was faced was that sometimes they'd fall through the cracks and they wouldn't be addressed. Mr. Winter, one of the, I mean, one of the things to be critical to me as a Californian is whether or not Cal ISO has hired such skill to help them protect prospectively the interests of California consumers. In other words, to keep a constant look at how the market is evolving and how it interacts with the system that we have uh, in terms of uh, the ability of people who've had this training, uh, either in the marketplace or in academia, to in effect calculate out this if if this happens if that happens does Cal ISO have that kind of service available to it? Yes, very clearly. Our whole department of market analysis is made up of PhD economists, who uh, that's their very role is to watch what's happening in real time, whether that has uh, market impacts. Uh, we've further implemented that a uh, market surveillance committee that's made up of Dr. Wallach and and a group of others, uh, academics, who uh, then review what's happening in the market using the data that our market development or our market analysis people pull off of real time so that they constantly monitor the market and, and identify any shortfalls that happen. Now, do we have a, uh, a computer model that we go into and, and do experimental things? Uh, no, we tried to develop one of those. Uh, in conjunction with uh, some people from Los Alamos. Uh, and as my understanding is, we've not been able to develop one that we felt was, uh, was sufficient to actually look at the future. So you have people on staff who are gaming the system in a protective sense? Well, they certainly are looking at it, you know, and well, but trying in a to protective demo. sense, trying yeah, to anticipate absolutely. where the attacks are going to come. Right, and and, and as uh, some of the other witnesses have identified, the whole development was an open process, and many during those process, we would come up with and say, well, what about this? People could do this, or people could do that, and so we'd look at it and and. Uh, if it appeared to be a major flaw, then we'd correct it. If it was something that would raise its level to, gee, you better watch this the first couple of weeks of the market operation to make sure people aren't taking care of it, uh, we looked at those. Some of them we recognized very clearly that we didn't have the knowledge or the, the ability to go outside the state and see what were people were doing on circulating schedules, et cetera. So we pointed that out to FERC many times. Now, FERC uh, issued an order, I think, in December of 99 regarding the manner in which ISO handled market congestion in terms, I, was it? I believe it was referred to as Market Design 2002. No, Market Design 2000. And it asked ISO to implement uh, this particular order. And in the context of that, or content of that order, there were a number of things from a rulemaking standpoint that FERC wanted to see done. Now, this corresponded quite closely to the period of time during which the then existing 26 member board of the Cal ISO was replaced with the five-member board of Cal ISO. It's my understanding that that particular order never was implemented. Do you have any recollection of that? You know, we've uh, received like 44 orders from FERC, <laughs> and I'd have to let, let go back up. and review right. which one it is. We'll follow up on that in writing, okay. so that would be, that's fine. Now, the, 
I just want to go back to the point. You've got people on staff, what we call really smart guys, uh, who sit and they look at the market and they try and anticipate where the uh, imbalances might occur and move the system accordingly to prevent those imbalances from occurring. Actually, what they're trying to do is look at market design and see uh, whether or not uh, people are, quote, gaming the system. And then they look at the real data that's coming in and identifies those areas where we think there's market power abuse, whether or not uh, when a line goes out, people suddenly have up the price, a bidding price, because they sense congestion will be there. They're, mo they're monitoring all of those activities. All right. Just for simplicity's sake, I'm going to thank you for putting people on staff kind of to do the anti-game thing in favor of the California consumer. I do appreciate that. <laughs> so. Mr. Or, uh, Dr. Sacchetti, in your testimony, you state that there's nothing, if I got this quote correctly, remotely illegal, unethical, or even questionable about what Perot Systems did and or offered to do in California's markets. I mean, following up on Mr. Winter's comment about, I mean, they've even got people on ISO staff who look at this stuff. Does this kind of marketing activity that, that did take place unsuccessfully, is that unusual? Does it take place in other commodity markets? Again, I'm, if there's a smoking gun here, I'm trying to find it. I think that the, uh, the idea of trying to teach utility uh, trade uh, um, sort of employees about competitive markets and about how to uh, be armed both offensively and defensively in commodity markets was a, an obvious place to try to attempt to offer services as I think uh, Dr. Backus and to some extent Perot Systems attempted to offer. Uh, because the culture of those industries were they were cost plus engineers, and that, nothing wrong with that, but that's what they were. They weren't economists, they weren't traders, they weren't used to dealing with commodities. You're referring to the, uh, the type of structure that they had previously existed under. Correct. Right. And then what happened was that uh, when the California system was going to go not just to a deregulation market, but to a virtually 100 percent commodity market, people thought there would be a good business to go out and teach people from this old culture how to participate and be wary of what could go wrong in this new commodity market. Uh, what happened was that essentially nobody who tried to do that training got hired because the industry went out and hired traders from other commodities, thinking that it was easier to teach people who knew how to trade corn and, and rice and wheat about electricity than it was to t teach electrical engineers and people who knew about the electric business in a traditional sense about commodity markets. So why, did, why didn't the investor-owned utilities like PG&E or Southern California Edison do the same thing? Well, they did. And, and in fact, I think that both the utilities did, in California... Did you, did you, you said they did do that. They did do that. Uh, they, they understood trading. In fact... So the investor-owned utilities had their own, so to speak, gaming department. Correct. And, okay. and, 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 and certainly they had a strategy. In fact, the problems in California, I think, began in terms of the, the gaming, if you will, by buyers underscheduling demand in the day ahead market of the California Power Exchange to get a lower price there for buyers or for consumers, knowing that they might be paying a higher price in the real time market that the ISO ran. And what happened was after the buyers started that process, this is something we discovered and reported in the state audit report, that's when the sellers adopted a similar strategy. And what happened was the real-time market that the CAISO ran, which was, a, which was supposed to be maybe 2 or 3% of the total energy in the state of California would flow through it. By late 2000, some 35% of all the energy traded in California was going through the CAISO market. And they were having to go out of market, buying power from other states in the region, much beyond the levels that would normally have been the case. And this is where... Uh, the, 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 the game of megawatt laundering was discovered. Uh, none of this, the underscheduling, which was mostly started by buyers, and megawatt hour laundering was something that 
anybody would have imagined would have been the natural uh, evolution of this market back when Pro Systems and Dr. Backus were offering their services to, to teach people about what happened in the UK. These were purely California problems, and it was the strategic buying behavior of the utilities in California that first started both the so-called uh, underscheduling issue and then secondly, uh, the megawatt hour laundering issue that came about as a result of people trying to avoid the price cap that emerged uh, quite foolishly only in California but not in the West. So you're, you're saying in a, quote, regularly functioning marketing, end quote, uh, you'd have buyers and sellers taking off, doing offensive and defensive tactics to protect themselves. Correct. And, and even the ISO takes offensive and defensive tactics. Well, They're well, not quite we, doing we just, what Mr. Winter... We just Winter, got that on the record. Oh, so. no, but I think Mr. Winter's suggesting that they're, they're playing a defensive game. I think that the ISO even plays an offensive game. Right. In fact, I think they attempted last week uh, with a stage one emergency to get a lower price uh, cap in effect. The public, uh, the, the, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission saw that this was uh, at least the result, whether it was a strategy or just simply a result, and said, no, we're not going to let the price cap fall below uh, the cap that's been working pretty well since last summer, and restored the cap to, to $92. I actually think the problem there was that when they, went, when they went to 57, the supply dried up. So they had to go back to the 92, well, 94. The, the, the fear was that that would happen, but, I, but I, I even doubt whether or not, in my mind, that the 57 was a new result as opposed to at least the possibility that the Kaiser was in, involved in in gaming the system. In fact, uh, I was at discussions of the market advisory group that I serve on where we discussed just that kind of strategy and just that kind of opportunity where the ISO could either cause prices to go lower in an emergency or cause or take actions to keep it from going higher in an emergency. Let me, let me just go back for a minute. You're on the market advisory committee of the CAISO, appointed by Governor Davis. Appointed by Governor Davis. Yes. And the Market Advisory Committee is discussing how to game the market? Both how to game it and how to be protected from gaming the market, yes. This is, this is not some kind of, uh, at least you should know that gaming is not some kind of illegal process if you play within the rules. It's a process that's meant to uh, understand the rules play within the rules and protect yourself when the rules are going to work against you and take advantage when the rules playing within them will allow you to get a benefit. Which brings me to my next question for Dr. Baca, Dr. Bacchus. Dr. Bacchus, on May 9th of 1997, you have an e I have an e I'm in possession of an email dated May 9th, 97, in which you state that a game to overbook power in the PX, and again, this is before the market's up, so you're, you're certainly prospective. You state that a game to overbook power in the PX could be worth over $50 million to Edison, and I believe you mean by that Southern California Edison. That is correct. Uh, can you explain the game that you're suggesting here? And I'd be happy to give you...
Gaming is not some kind of illegal process if you play within the rules. It's a process that's meant to uh, understand the rules, play within the rules, and protect yourself when the rules are going to work against you, and take advantage when the rules playing within them will allow you to get a benefit. Which brings me to my next question for Dr. Baca, Dr. Bacchus. Dr. Bacchus, on May 9th of 1997, You have an e I have an e I'm in possession of an email dated May 9th, 97, in which you state that a game to overbook power in the PX, and again, this is before the market's up, so you're it's certainly prospective. You state that a game to overbook power in the PX could be worth over $50 million to Edison, and I believe you mean by that Southern California Edison. That is correct. Uh, can you explain the game that you're suggesting here, and I'd be happy to give you no, I think well, I you can read it on the screen yeah, there right. if you'd like. So. <laughs> With one eye. <laughs> no, thank you. Um, yes, that was an important consideration. We had already very clearly determined that Edison would go bankrupt, along with PG&E, already at this very early stage before the markets opened at all. What do you mean, we? Who's we? I'm sorry. I would just say, well, actually, Edison and myself, as we had gone through and looked at what the rules look like, my analysis said, there's no way this market's going to work and you are going to lose a lot of money in a big hurry as soon as supply and demand get out of balance and prices go up and you can't pass on that price. So Edison had at least one consultant telling them that they're toast? Yes. Okay. Now, In fact, go it's forward. Actually, there's at least one. I think multiple people were already saying that they were toast. Well, well you may want to provide me with the names of the other consultants who were <laughs> telling them that, too. All right. I'll try to think of who those, those are. Let's go back to my question, though. Explain this game. All right, so the process here is to try to at least hold off the marketplace and also, in a sense, cause a little bit of volatility so that at least everybody could see that there was a very, very big problem approaching on the marketplace. It actually requires a lot of things to go on, so it actually goes one way and then the other. So the first logic is to, and we'll go through sequence because Dr. Shetty already went through some of those, um, is that we would first overbook the market dramatically. Overbook it on the day ahead? On the day ahead market that we would instead of Edison bidding in their normal amount, would bid in much higher than what it would normally bid. Multiples thereof, or merely? Just merely fraction. If it was multiples, it would be the end of life as we know it. So these are just a small percentage over the, the, the amount. And so that would actually cause them to see higher prices in that process, but it would also scare the generators in feeling that there was now a shortage, that Edison knew about some load that they didn't. And so in all their cleverness, they would then raise their prices in the hour ahead in an imbalanced market. When the time actually then came in the imbalance market for Edison to buy this energy, which would now be very, very expensive, it actually would sell the energy. And in so doing, its net average price would be lower than it would have otherwise have been. Now, this would upset the suppliers. <laughs> Just a minute. Let's say you've got 1,000 megawatts. Southern California said, well, we're going to generate 1,100. And then some uh, private generator over there says, whoa, what do they know that we don't? So they ramp up the price to a very large value. I mean, it might be 100 And then they million. bid into the hour ahead market accordingly on the next day in anticipation of the tight supply. Yes. And then all of a sudden, 100, megawatt de 100 megawatts worth of scheduled demand goes poof. Actually, it's even different than that. You can actually sell the demand in those days. You could sell the demand back into the I ISO as if it was generation, because you essentially own that generation from the day ahead market. So you were so selling. Southern California Edison then put, puts money in its pocket for that increment that it sells into the hour ahead market. Yes, now on net it only needed the 10,000 megawatts, and so therefore the net average price it had to pay was much less, and so it could survive a little bit longer. Now this would certainly upset the suppliers, and so the next day, if we can think that they're not too clever, you would grossly underbid, and all of a sudden, all the suppliers would say, oh my gosh, Edison must know there's a storm coming or something, and the market's useless. You know, we've got to keep our plants running, so just bid your you know, minimum cost into the hour ahead market and into the imbalance market just to keep our plants running, because we can't stand to shut down nukes and coal plants and such. And so now all of a sudden, Edison, when it finally comes to be the day ahead, really does demand a lot of energy, but the price is very low, so they're still better off. So now, the rules of the marketplace allowed this phantom demand to be entered into the market? There was the hope that that was the case. It was on the books. To my understanding, Edison then went to their general counsel, who then went to the CPUC, and the answer is no, we could not allow that. And so Edison then 
decided that wait, not wait, wait. You went to who? The General Counsel of Southern California Edison. Whose name is? I think it was Mr. Forney at that time. All I right. don't remember his, his uh, first name. Um, I believe w w someone in his group, I mean, I, I went to the CPUC to ask whether this would be a legitimate process that, or do we have to actually bid in, as Paul pointed out, the 90% into the PX market and another three into the day ahead and the rest of the imbalance, or whatever the numbers are, whether they could actually make this a variable number just to try to prevent prices from going up and that, that they wouldn't go bankrupt and they wouldn't see these huge prices on the marketplace. And my understanding is the answer came back that no, the CPUC would look disfavorably at that. So Edison, and I take this literally, actually I had managers who look at the rate of cry saying it really is hopeless for us. So this request of the CPUC was made between apparently May 9th, 97 and March 31 and 98? Yes. Do you know, who, do you know to whom the request was made at the CPUC? <sighs> No, I don't. All I know is that when I brought up the process, they would say we would check on it, and several months later, I heard back to say they wouldn't go for it. And How so many we, several months later? Uh, um, it was. It could even actually have been after the market started. I simply don't remember that that uh, concept of, of uh, what the timing was. I just know that they said they would check it out, and they came back later at a visit I had taken there, and they said, by the way, it wasn't allowed, and so therefore we are in bad and, shape. And so at that point, the Edison people with whom you were working with? They actually, uh, their strategy then became, which is a strategy I believe they pursued, they just said, our only hope is to become the perfect victim. That is, we will do nothing to defend ourselves, we will do nothing on offense, we will just simply ride this through and hope that California bails us out when all this is said and done. So if I understand you correctly, Edison took the precaution of hiring consultants who would help them from a def financially defensive standpoint game the system for protective purposes. Yes, sir. And then the California see. Public Utility Commission said, well, that's all great, but you can't do that. That is correct. In fact, I understand, and, and maybe Paul has more examples of, this, of many other cases where perfectly legitimate gaming processes were proposed and the statement is, no, you will follow the rules this way. So, so the, CPUC not only prevented investor-owned utilities from entering into the forward contract market after August of 99, but then they also basically emasculated them in terms of defending themselves financially by reversing the game on the guys who are just hammering them. Yes, in fact, I always call it the wolf because you always knew every day, the generator always knew exactly how much demand was going to go on the day ahead market and can do whatever they wanted to stop them. And this was a function of the rules and regulations under which the ISO market operated or the PX market operated? Well, now it gets to be sort of a little more complicated because you could have designed different rules like allow a forward market that would well, have gotten my, rid of it. my next question is going to be was anything ever done to fix that? And I may direct that at Mr. Winter or any of the others, but to my knowledge, nothing. Certainly, again, starting very early, we were showing all sorts of problems. Paul was trying to show problems. Many of those problems are already obvious almost immediately when the market opened. And to my knowledge, nobody, I mean, that was my yelling and screaming of why I went everywhere to commissions, hundreds of presentations, trying to wave the flag to say, these are big problems, you should, it's all right to make mistakes, but the bigger problem is when you don't fix them. And so that was what was going on in California. So it's your testimony between May 9th, 97, March 31 and 98, Edison knew they were gonna get hammered. Yes. They figured it out. And so did PG&E. My closing remark to PG&E is, in four years, you will be bankrupt, which did not, wasn't a very good selling pitch either, but nonetheless, that was the truth. Now, <laughs> Mr. Winter, I mean, our, your perspective, please. Well, uh, certainly I'm not aware of any uh, activities between Edison and PG&E and the PUC. I wouldn't be privy to that. I guess I'm uh, uh, a little uh, curious. Uh, the first two years, we very clearly uh, saw a market that was extremely beneficial to the investor-owned utilities, and they certainly made back a large portion of their uh, stranded costs during that time frame. So in the beginning, even though we were monitoring the market and were aware of some of these programs or games, if you will, they obviously were not being played to any extent. And as other people have pointed out, clearly when we started getting into the demand and, and supply problems is when things took off and became very unstable. Um, I, uh, I, I guess beyond that, I'm not 
too clear on exactly what was being proposed and what was not being proposed. Dr. Sacchetti? Yeah, uh, Dr. Backus talked about one of the things that the CPUC said couldn't be done, which was uh, the game that was a complicated game where you would overschedule in the day ahead market so as to create conditions of instability in the real-time energy imbalance or CAISO market and to be able to make money as a utility trading. The CPUC, and it's my understanding, uh, agrees with Dr. Bacchus, said no, you can't do that. But the CPUC didn't stop the utilities in California from underscheduling as opposed to overscheduling in the day ahead market. And in fact, it was the underscheduling of the utilities in terms of saying they wanted to buy less than they really needed in the day ahead market that caused this incredible shift of the energy supply in California onto the backs of the CAISO, which had the responsibility in real time to make certain that there would be sufficient power that caused them to go out of state, out of market, out of sequence, and to do literally anything that it took to keep the lights on. It was when that happened in conjunction with the supply demand imbalance or gap, if you will, that things literally in November, December of 2000 went absolutely into this chaotic crisis that we're all aware of when the price of electricity jumped from uh, the level it had been in 99 of $25, I think Congressman Waxman said, to over $1,000. And it was this strategy of gaming on behalf of the buyers, followed then by a match strategy on the part of the sellers that shifted the burden onto the California independent system operator. And I think the numbers are in December of 2000 to have to meet 35% of the total energy requirements of California when it was designed to be about maybe 2 or 3% on, on the extreme and uh, certainly not anything like the 35% they had to uh, find the ability to go out and, and acquire the electricity for. And this, of course, also set up because of price caps put into effect in that same period in the CAISO market only for California market participants. This caused the so-called megawatt hour laundering practices to begin where either the municipal utilities in California or out-of-state entities could either buy power or take their power that they would have otherwise sold to the CAISO, but to sell it roundabout back into the state uh, at a much higher price and avoid those price caps. And both of these problems are things that uh, in the state audit report we pointed to, the underscheduling and the megawatt hour laundering. And eventually, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission went ahead and took steps to prevent both kinds of things from happening. And they continue to take steps as recently as this week at the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission to modify the rules now having a, a restriction on a single bid price, which the CAISO proposed, as to get around the kind of gaming between markets that uh, we saw back in, in 2000. So it's like a train wreck that occurred in 2000 before the California uh, or in the California energy market. Many things have been fixed. It's not safe to say there'll never be another train wreck, but many of the things that were done in 2000 and 2001 are now prohibited by the actions of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Uh, after the fact, to be sure, but preventive in terms of keeping things that happened as they occurred back then from happening again. You can't make it hour launder. You can't uh, game the system through uh, uh, bidding between markets or different prices between markets. There are penalties for underscheduling that have some bite in them. There are prohibitions against the so-called overloading congestion lines uh, that are associated with Enron. These are fixes that have been made, but the fundamental problems uh, are, are still potentially present, except for the fact that now the market is mostly a long-term market and less volatile, therefore, because so much of the energy is under a long-term contract. Dr. Cicchetti, in your opinion, had the California Public Utilities Commission allowed the investor-owned utilities to enter into long-term contracts pursuant to their request in August of 99, would our difficulties ever have arisen? There would have been high prices because of the supply-demand condition, just as there was in the Midwest in 1999. 
But the Midwest, when they had the high prices in 1999, had only 85% or so of the energy was under long-term contract and, or owned by the, the Midwest and utilities. And therefore, the high prices when they flew up only affected 10 to 15% of the market. They got the same headlines as California, but they didn't cause the same damage in terms of bankrupting the utilities or causing the states in the Midwest to have to come in and buy the power. So California's your, your, your point is not only the ability to long-term contract, but that portion of the total portfolio that had to be purchased in the day-ahead market. Exactly. And, and that was the thing that has eventually caused California as a state to step up and sign uh, both the purchase contracts as well as enter into its own long-term contracts because unlike the utilities, California as a state was able to enter into long-term contracts beginning as they did in February, March or so of 2001. And I want to be clear, neither of those, Mr. Winter, neither of those decisions or rules are jurisdictional to ISO. Those are both PUC regulations. That's correct. Now, uh, Dr. Gribick, in terms, in your opening statement, you mentioned that on several occasions you brought market design flaws to the attention of the ISO and the PX. And according to what you've uh, given us, you alerted ABB of a design flaw in the real-time market in early May of 97, and I've got a document, document number 11, if you'd put that up, please. And then w when you noticed the problem had not yet been fixed, you made a November 7th, 97 presentation to the ISO explaining the flaw, and that's document number 12. Can you explain the nature of this problem and the steps that led to it being fixed? Okay. The, uh, the problem was a flaw in the ISO's real-time market protocol. And that, at a high level, uh, the flaw would allow a generator to place unscheduled power on th into the ISO's real-time market. It would start dumping power in. And it, it could submit some bids to buy back power, which would in effect cause the real-time market price to go to whatever level that that participant desired. So it could, it could pump power into the ISO's real-time market and simultaneously set the price it would be paid for that power to any level. As, as I said uh, in the testimony, uh, I alerted the ISO and ABB programmers to this in the uh, beginning of May of 97. They told me that uh, this process was known, or this problem was known. They had discussed it in the WAPEX process. They had a way to fix it, that somehow it just fell through the cracks, that they would take care of it. Uh, at the end of October of 97, I was at that time providing consulting services to the PX. And I read the ISO's protocols and saw that the problem still was there. I alerted Jim Critikson, who was then director of scheduling at the power exchange, about this problem and devised an example to show how serious this flaw could be. In essence, I showed him a strategy a market player could use to dump power and simultaneously set the price. He had me explain it to the uh, CEO and the president of the power exchange and they instructed us to go to the, uh, to the ISO and inform them of the power exchange's concern. We went up, gave them a presentation where we outlined the problem, outlined the strategy. Uh, I believe the ISO recognized the seriousness of the problem, and I believe they took it to their market participant process because I received calls afterwards from several market participants asking me to explain the problem. And uh, the ISO fixed the problem uh, by, in essence, adjusting the bid prices that people would submit to prevent the problem from occurring before the market opened. So it was patched well before the market opened. Okay, and the market opened again on uh, April 1st, April 1 of 98, and you had this thing fixed roughly by the end of December of 97. I believe it was, they had it fixed by December 97. Mr. Winters, my Mr. Winter, my compliments. Yeah, well, thank you. Now, you, Dr. Gribick, you also noticed a problem with transmission congestion pricing, and on, according to my information, on January 30th, 98, you brought that problem to the attention of Jim Critikson at the PX, who also instruct, who instructed you again to contact the ISO. 
That's document number 13 on the screen right now. Uh, yes. Now, who is Jim Critickson? Uh, Jim Critickson was director of scheduling for the power exchange, and he was the uh, power exchange person responsible for, uh, uh, basically did oversight of the, the work that the Pro Systems was doing for the power exchange. And uh, see, the problem in this case was uh, the way that the ISO was going to set what they called default usage charges. Uh, the problem could have caused high prices and adversely affected reliability in the ISO uh, system. In essence, uh, to give you, oh, to explain this in detail would take several hours, but I'll try to give you a very high level Abbreviate overview. Abbreviate it, please. Yes. <laughs> Uh, unfortunately, this stuff gets very convoluted. Uh, roughly, the ISO allocates or, uh, scheduling coordinators, submit schedules to the ISO. The ISO checks to see if it can accommodate those schedules without overloading any of the transmission elements. If any transmission elements are overloaded, it allocates transmission to the scheduling coordinators who place the highest value on using the transmission as indicated by bids that they submit. Uh, the ISO allocates the transmission to the highest value used first, the next highest, and so on. And at the end, it charges everyone the price, uh, sets the price for using the transmission to the value set by the last person that gets on. The problem is that people do not have to submit bids for using the transmission. They can say, I'm willing to pay anything to use it. Now. If the ISO runs out of bids to manage the transmission based on economics, it will allocate pro rata the transmission to those who did not submit bids, who in essence said, I will pay anything to use it. It still has to, however, charge them for using the transmission. The ISO protocols as of October 31st, 97, said that they were going to pick the usage charge, in this case the default usage charge when they ran out of economic bids, by looking at the price for power in yesterday's real-time market. And they would set the usage charge equal to yesterday's real-time market price. What I pointed out to uh, Mr. Critickson is if yesterday's real-time market price was very low, say a dollar per megawatt, which could happen, in fact sometimes it was zero, you've destroyed any incentive for people who value the path more than a dollar to submit a bid. Because why would I bid to use the path at $10 whenever I may be taken off and it's given to somebody else for a dollar? In essence, it becomes a free-for-all. Everyone comes rushing in to submit the uh, schedules to use transmission. They will not give you adjustment bids because why should they bid to use it when they say, I'll pay anything, I only pay a dollar. You're saying this drove the price to zero. Whatever the situation, it would drive the price to zero because the guys who needed the transmission figured it out. Yeah, they'd figure it out and say, hey, I'm looking at yesterday's price. It's only a dollar. I will uh, just overload this transmission line knowing that I'll only be charged a dollar. Right. And because it was pro rata allocation, they would even have incentive to uh, bid to use more. Now, if I, if I understand what you did, working with critics in first and the ISO, you were able to fix this problem. Uh, yes, uh, Jim Critickson told me to take it to the ISO uh, stakeholder process. There were a series of conference calls and meetings, I believe, that the ISO was holding on the congestion management process. And at those meetings and conference calls, I raised this issue and said that uh, you cannot set the price for using transmission today using yesterday's energy price. It was a hard sell to people because, in essence, I was trying to tell them they you should be pay. willing to pay more. Right. No one wants to hear that. But, so, in, but in effect, at the end of the day, prior to the March 31 operational date, this issue got fixed. Yes, the ISO right. submitted two amendments to its tariff, I think amendments four and six, which, which alleviated the problem. All right. Now, in, uh, in an April 9th, 1998, first of all, let me go back and say, Mr. Winter, I, my compliments on fixing it again. Uh, in an April 9th, 1998 memo from you to Fred Mobasheri, you discussed the need for market surveillance capabilities at the PX. Now, we've talked about market surveillance capabilities that exist at the ISO. Um, document 14 is on the screen, I believe. 
Who is Fred Mobasheri? Uh, Fred Mobasheri was the manager of the uh, market monitoring unit at the uh, Power Exchange. In essence, a sister organization to the market surveillance unit at the uh, ISO. Was the PX vulnerable to being gamed by market participants? Well, I would say that uh, anyone out there was going to start developing strategies to try to defend themselves and to also take a, a advantage of the rules where possible. Uh, what I was concerned about, because I had found these flaws sitting on the surface of the ISO and PX protocols, uh, whereby a single participant could have destabilized the markets, I was concerned that there might be more of these floating around out there. And I was recommending to uh, Dr. Mobusheri that, uh, that the PX should set up a team that would proactively seek out those types of flaws, identify them, uh, identify the types of strategies people might make, figure out uh, what the markers were that you could detect when somebody was using them, and either, if they could, change their protocols so those things could not be employed, or at the very least, start looking for the markers whenever inappropriate behavior was being done so that they could take action. So you game the system on behalf of the PX, purely in a theoretical manner. I was recommending... Actually, at that, that point, PX. it would not have been theoretical. It was post-April 1st. Yes. Uh, so you game the system, sent a memo to Mobashiri. Uh, did the PX take your advice? Uh, nothing came of it. Uh, they, they did have a market monitoring unit. Uh, uh, my estimation was that they were more in a reactive mode than a proactive mode, that they were reacting to what they saw in the market rather than trying to get ahead of the participants to patch holes before uh, people use them. Let me move on in the interest of time here. Uh, I do appreciate your attempts okay. at trying to fix these holes. Uh, Mr. Winter, were the... Uh, I, ha I have to admit to some uh, serious concern about the revelations laid out in the Enron memos, you know, about Fat Boy and Ricochet and all this other stuff. Uh, and yet, I'm trying to determine whether or not those practices were illegal at the time they were done. Were they illegal at the time they were done? Well, this is going to sound evasive. I'm not an attorney and really can't determine the legality. But having said that, certainly if you come in and tell someone that you're providing firm power and then you're not providing firm power, um, I would call that uh, somewhat illegal and violates WSCC criteria. I think if you say that you've got a unit that is available to run and I'm going to provide you a thousand megawatts and then you find out the unit's been broken and was never able to run, I think that's uh, totally, uh, I, I wouldn't, I don't know, I say illegal, but certainly not, uh, not something that you could uh, do. I think as far as arbitraging between markets, uh, that's something that clearly was uh, uh, permitted. And if you have sufficient infrastructure, transmission, and generation, uh, that's exactly what you want the market to do, because it will then find its equilibrium and, and uh, uh, the markets will then become very efficient as you use those. But uh, I think to say whether or not they were illegal, I would refer you to my my uh, appendix two of my testimony where we went through each of them and and explained, uh, you know, what the practice was, what we had done about it, and whether or not it was prohibited from our uh, market monitoring rules. Do the rules prevent it now? Uh, can, can, let me just let me phrase the question that way. Can California's consumers be uh, comfortable with with the nature of the market now being such as to prevent such gaming? Well, clearly, uh, we came out with uh, five points, five of the practices, and, and sent out a market notice saying that these were illegal and people should not practice in. And again, you can read those uh, in my uh, testimony. Um, as far as the others, uh, we've been very concerned about activities that happen outside the state because we don't have visibility to that. I think FERC's uh, recent decision 
has gone a long ways to correct that. They're, they're they must a, offer. Thing. Must offer the uh, maximum, you know, bid, bid cap at 250. They're auto get automated uh, um, uh, program that kicks in if you suddenly spike your uh, bid prices. I think these go a long ways to protect it. Now, if I've learned anything in the last four years, it's no matter what kind of rule you come up with, there are very clever people who try to find ways around that and often do. So I can't stand here and just absolutely give you assurance that it would never happen again. But I think there's been enough attention on it that if we saw something in the marketplace that was clearly out of line, we'd get the action of FERC and those others very quickly. Gentlemen, I need to confer with my counsel here for a couple minutes. We're going to take a two-minute recess. When Dr. Backus uh, comes in, we'll just go ahead and proceed accordingly. Uh, Mr. Warner, I want to. One of the things that I keep coming back to is uh, the confidence the California consumer can have as to whether or not market participants are in effect unethically or illegally gaming the system, what measures are being taken by the appropriate government entity to protect the California consumers from that, and then the range of who's participating in this. I, wanna, I do want to ask you for an update on the issue having to do with, uh, I believe, one of ISO's people on the floor. Um, let me just state my question here. 
Uh, in July of 2001, a conversation took place between one of ISO's employees and an Enron trader in which the employee asked the Enron trader to submit a specific bid. This employee was fired and an investigation was ordered. I'd like to know the status of that investigation. Okay, the, um, when we uh, learned through documents that Senator Dunn had uh, gathered, uh, we, had, we found reference to a uh, person who was on the floor that had had a conversation with an Enron employee. Um, we reviewed that. Uh, first, uh, I think we got that information on a Friday. Uh, we uh, hired an independent uh, law firm to come in and do an investigation for us. Um, in the meantime, we talked to the employee. He admitted that he had done it. It was clearly in violation of our uh, code of conduct. And so we terminated him. The investigation then went on and, and the law firm had reviewed both vertically and horizontally, uh, different members of the corporation, different schedulers, the chain of command, and found out that uh, this did appear, and, and that is the finding of the report, that this was one individual's action and it was, was not uh, widespread throughout the corporation. Uh, that report has been completed and uh, given to our board, and uh, uh, that's the status of it, and Senator Dunn has also been informed. Uh, two questions. Can I get a copy of the report at the conclusion of the investigation? Uh, yes, it was a confidential report since it dealt with personalities, but I don't see any reason why you could not get it done. I do appreciate that. Second question, you used the word that, or the phrase that these were not widespread practices. I mean, they're, one they're more than, they're just one person. Just one person. Okay. So they're just, they're very unique to this person. Yes, it was. According to the investigation, okay. So it's not widespread? Not at all. All right. Dr. Cicchetti, the, uh, The new rules on trading practices that the ISO has adopted, do you th believe these will be successful? I think that they will uh, be successful in terms of eliminating the pricing gaming between markets. Uh, but two other things that the ISO has started, I mean, sorry, that the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission has started were also necessary. Uh, the first is the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission has effectively ordered the ISO to develop nodal pricing so that the kind of congestion gaming that has received so much attention today and and uh, as part of the Enron memo uh, wouldn't be one of the games that could be played because of nodal pricing would effectively replace the kind of uh, congestion path pricing or valuation that's in the current tariff. And the second thing that the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission has ordered is to change the CAISO board to make it an independent board. Uh, the current board is a political board. There's no other way around it. Uh, I don't think that's particularly a, a problem or has been a particular problem that's caused gaming. But the old stakeholder board, both of the CAISO and the CPX, and the work I did for the State Audit Bureau, as well as the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission's own review, uh, we both found that the market monitoring committees and staff of both the CAISO and the California Power Exchange reported problems, and the process of getting those problems reported and then out to the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission so as to fix the problems uh, was stalled by the stakeholder board process. And so the independent boards are an important part of restoring faith that mitigation, which is an important part of any commodity uh, market, that is policing markets is an important function, that those policing activities of the staff, and the staffs of both in the case of the CPX, which no longer really exist, but in the case of the CAISO, very excellent staffs, so that, that material gets out and in the hands of Federal Energy Regulatory Commission sooner rather than later. And, and now to uh, complete the process, 
I think the, uh, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission this past week has ordered uh, California to develop a, a, a purely independent board, uh, not a stakeholder board, not a governor appointee board, but one that's purely independent. And that'll help restore some of the market along with the new locational uh, nodal pricing that will be put in, into effect. Thank you, Doctor. The, uh, let me follow on, if I may. And you know, we've had a large debate about a regional transmission organization, whether California should or should not participate. What's your opinion on that issue? Personally, I think that a regional transmission organization for the West makes a great deal of sense. In fact, we saw problems that occurred through uh, megawatt hour laundering, ricochet, whatever you want to call it, because we had essentially a two-tier market. Uh, that's been fixed to some extent by the fact that uh, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission came up with a, a Western state's price cap. But fundamentally, I think we have to do more than that because we have to deal with the, the, the congestion problems for transmission that exists throughout the entire West, not just in California. The problem is that given California's terrible crisis in 2000 and 2001, not very many other Western states want to partner or participate in a regional transmission organization with California. So uh, while I think it's the right way to go, it's the right model, it's, it's ultimately going to be necessary, I think that it's, it's probably more likely that the Southwest and then the, the Pacific Northwest will form their own RTOs eventually to be merged together as well as to be merged with California. But for the short term, I think California has to continue to do what it's been doing, which is to regain stability and see the return of competition and lower prices as we're, we've been seeing in, in the past uh, 12 months or so. But we need probably a bit more time to convince the neighboring states to go along with an RTO that would include California unless somehow or other Congress orders uh, such a thing to happen, which I don't see happening. Thank you. I have a couple more very specific questions. Uh, Mr. Winter, down in the San Diego area, there is some debate as to whether or not to build a transmission line north-south linking the San Diego market to Southern California Edison. Would that be a positive or are you positive towards that, ambivalent? Are you negative towards it? Is it, what's your perspective? I'm extremely positive toward it but it's just first a small link in what we need to do. It's called the Valley Rainbow 500 interconnection from uh, northern San Diego up to uh, a valley substation in the Los Angeles area. Now, but what we need to do is then complete the next link of that, which is Rainbow to McGill, which brings us next to the Mexican border. Right now, we're seeing uh, about uh, 1,000 megawatts plus being developed in Mexico, and the way that's going to get into the entire grid is up through San Diego. So we've got to, to add to the infrastructure in that, that area, as well as Path 15, to allow the north-south transfer of uh, large blocks of energy out of the southwest and the northwest. I will tell you for a fact that uh, most of the California delegation is very supportive of Path 15. Uh, working through the Bureau and others. Can you give us some sense of the status of the negotiations on that, given the different stakeholders? Uh, it's my understanding that the uh, there's actually two proposals, one before the Public Utility Commission that would have PG&E build the uh, entire line. The other one is uh, the uh, 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 Western Area Power Authority would be the uh, federal agency that would be building it, and an independent uh, transmission company would provide about 85% of the money with the remainder coming from PG&E. And uh, both of those proposals are, are moving ahead. As to which one is going to win, I don't know at this time. But both are integral to solving the transmission problem. Yes. Either, either, uh, either one of them would do it. All right, let me just, I want to summarize here. I just want to be clear. I heard all four of you say you don't know of 
any non-public information that Perot or its well, some of you actually testified you had not used it. Do any of you know of any non-public information that was used in the presentations to various parties about the structure of the ISO market? Mr. Winter? I uh, certainly am not aware of any. However, all I saw was what I've been provided at this point. All right. Dr. Sacchetti? No, and I will only add to what Mr. Winter said by pointing out that I found some of the identical material being used in the pro systems that the CAISO, or the California Independent System Operator, uses in its own training materials. All right. Dr. Bacchus, you testified that you didn't have any non-public information that you all, used in your presentation? All I knew was the public information, so that's all that could be contained within the presentations. And Dr. Grivick, your testimony was uh, consistent with that? Yes, uh, d used absolutely no proprietary information. All right, gentlemen. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you all for coming. Uh, one of the things we struggle with back here is, frankly, getting to the bottom of it without a lot of hue and cry. Uh, we have a continuing problem in our state about supply of energy and the ability to obtain energy at reasonable prices. Frankly, I can understand why Mr. Winter and his colleagues at the ISO were upset when they learned what possibly Pro Systems was doing. Uh, I have to applaud your logical means of resolving that, where you actually sat down, communicated to each other uh, your concerns, worked it out. Uh, frankly, based on the testimony today and the documents we've received to date, uh, I'm at a bit of a loss to explain all the allegations I'm familiar with. The other aspect of this that I think is germane is that uh, <laughs> Number one, the, the work that Pro Systems did took place prior to the market opening, and then that which they tried to do with what's alleged to be non-public information, nobody bought. I mean, I, I just don't, I mean, I'm not, I don't understand this. Maybe I'm missing something. Based on the information we have today, I just, I'm afraid we've used two and a half hours for little purpose. Now, the uh, other things I want you to understand is that to the extent, Mr. Winter, that you or Dr. Sacchetti, your colleagues on the market committee can continue to use gaming theory to protect California's consumers, I want to encourage you to do that. I mean, I just, I just think it's, a, uh, it's great for California's consumers to have that as a defensive effort. I don't know how you massage this thing with the CPUC who says, well, you can have some tools, but you can't have others, even though you know your competitors have them uh, to stick it to you. This market design issue is going to stay with us. Uh, I know it's going to evolve over time. I look forward to working with all four of you as we try and address these things in an evolutionary fashion. Again, I thank you for coming today. Appreciate your testimony. We're adjourned. Here's what's coming up. Remarks from the National Conservative...